Hello there. My name is Daniel Backer, and this is Write Better Stories. This is my son, Lawrence Backer. He's been biting the shit out of my ear all day, so I'm sure he'll continue to do that during this video. So uh, my voice definitely feels a little raspy. I feel like I'm getting sick, but I could not wait to make this video, so we're going to jump into it anyway. But um, before we do that, I uh, wanted to let you know that I started improv classes again recently. This is something that I haven't done in more than four years now, so I am excited to get back into it. I signed up for UCB classes, which is fun, and uh, I have mentioned in other videos that improv is something that can improve your writing a lot, even if you don't care about performing a lot, because improv really teaches you the importance of dynamics in your scene, making sure that action takes place, make sh making sure that you take emotional choices. So. Look into my playlist called The Bare Bones of Story if you want to get a little bit more information about that. But I'll, yeah, I'll keep you updated with my path to fame. So today we're going to talk about a short story in a collection called Dubliners by James Joyce. And uh, I'll confess to start out that most of James Joyce's stuff bores me to tears. It is something that I, I feel bad about because so many people gush about him as being one of the greatest writers of all time. And in the short story I'm going to mention today, I definitely see that. But in his uh, more masterful, respected works like Ulysses and Portrait of the Artist of... Uh, I almost said the old man. Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man. I might have messed up a word or two in there. Um, I just can't get into it. A lot of the uh, Catholic imagery kind of bores me. And... Uh, I think a lot of the time period, too, is, is just difficult for me to get into, and that's actually a similar feeling that I had with this story until the end of the story, and I was like, whoa, this is, this is one of the best things I've ever read. So the story is called The Dead, and this is not something that you should let me spoil for you, and I'm definitely going to do that if you haven't read it before, so please pause this video. Make sure you go read The Dead. It is a little bit longer, but you can probably get through it like an hour and a half or so in order to really savor the text, but um, yeah, I was reading The Dead because I was assigned to read Dubliners in college, and as I was reading it, I was like, so yeah, some of the short stories are good, but the first half of The Dead, I was just like, you know, I can't do this. This is about this stuffy dinner party, and it's just about this guy that has to give a speech, and he's tr make wants to make sure that he impresses everybody with his speech, and it, it was just very difficult for me to get into, but yeah, by the end, I I was completely just whiplashed in the other direction because it's a very powerful ending, and it sort of retroactively um, takes all the parts that are harder to get into at the beginning and makes them more meaningful. So I will especially say that The Dead is a story that rewards you for reading it more than one time because there's a lot of little details that get placed along the route that you don't really catch the first time, or I did not catch the first time. But in reading it again and sort of seeing where the story is going, it becomes a lot more meaningful. Um, this is also a story that I return to a lot um, every time that I'm working on something, because I just want to see, like, how did he do it in the dead? How did he mesh all of these really high-minded ideas in such a subtle way that you almost don't even notice them until the end when they just completely hit you in the face? So. Um, I don't want to elevate it too much, but uh, again, it is James Joyce. He is one of the sort of towering giants of the literature world, so I don't think I'm exaggerating in saying that. This uh, story especially is amazing, so do yourself a favor. Read the dead. I've got a few passages picked out today because this is another one of those ones that almost every line of this story you can interpret and go pretty deep with, so there's really just not enough hours in the day, and... Yeah, there's, there's a billion reasons why I can't go through all of this. Mostly due to audience interest. They probably don't want to see that. But um, some of the more um, popular passages in here are the ones that really struck me. I think really have to do with uh, this character change that the main character named Gabriel Conroy undergoes toward the end of the story. So I had mentioned that he goes to a dinner party with his wife, and you don't really understand where it's going. Um... And I don't think that that's necessarily a criticism of the story. I think it's very intentional, actually, is that Gabriel thinks that his story, if I can use that sort of language, is about him having to give a speech at the dinner. And they make it clear inside of the story that he is uh, maybe more well-educated than everyone else in his family, and so he's really worried about not condescending to them. And so he's established as sort of a heady guy, 
that is, uh, yeah, wrestling with wanting to impress everybody with this speech because he's a writer in the story. And uh, I think a lot of people have decided that this is like a thinly veiled character for James Joyce himself. Uh, but yeah, he, he wants to impress everybody with this speech, but he also is kind of wrestling with putting in a quote from Keats or Shakespeare, but he's like, ah, they, are they going to think that I'm just like showing off and being a pr uh, pretentious guy? So uh, I think that's definitely relatable because literature does have a very, oh, stiff, pretentious stereotype to it, and so that's something that I've definitely struggled with because I want to be able to talk about these high-minded ideas, but I want to make sure that I'm actually uh, sharing something substantial and not just showing off. Now, I don't want to be too pure about it either because I think that writing and, uh, and stories are definitely a very ego-driven pursuit too, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but yeah, I think you should be having pleasure when you're doing it, or what's the point? If it hurts, why do you do it? So um, I think it, you can definitely relate to it if you're a writer. But the fact that he thinks that his story is about giving him the speech, and then the speech kind of comes and goes, um, does speak to a larger theme in the story of him figuring out what this story is about for himself. He has to sort of discover where the meaning is to be extracted in this, and the idea of extracting meaning from something is a prevalent thing in this story, which um, other people who are into reading different postmodern works might be able to get a lot out of this one because I think this might be considered before the postmodern period, but the idea of symbols and extracting meaning from these different symbols is definitely a theme, and an active theme too. It's not necessarily as heady as it sounds. He definitely brings it down to earth with Gabriel basically trying to interpret different images in his life, different moments and different scenes and deciding what they mean, trying to extract meaning from them, and then being wrong in some cases. And so I think that people can get uh, sort of scared away by some of that because it does seem very cerebral and very heady, but I think that something that can help you when you're reading somebody like James Joyce or like Thomas Pynchon is somebody that definitely uses a lot of imagery that I don't know if you're necessarily supposed to understand it, but it's more about that you are trying to understand it. That can be the takeaway that guides you through some of these stories that are critiquing language and symbols. It's not necessarily about the scene that they're building. It might be full of historical references and different things that you would really have to consult an encyclopedia or encyclopedia, Wikipedia, or an online resource or some outside resource to completely understand every reference in it. However, since it is so involved with the interpretation of symbols and what they might mean, it's more about that the meaning is pot potent rather than any one specific meaning. So I hope I made that clear to you. It's definitely something that um, is pretty important to the story. So before I babble on forever, I've got three passages picked out that I am really attached to, so I'm going to read them and do my best to talk about them. So this first one is basically the night after he gives the speech, he ends up staying at, uh, I think it's his aunt's house, that it's his two aunts that live together where the party took place. And so he gives the speech, they go to bed, the next morning everybody's waking up and uh, filtering out the door. It's kind of that morning after. So, Gabriel had not gone to the door with the others. He was in a dark part of the hall gazing up the staircase. A woman was standing near the top of the first flight in the shadow also. He could not see her face but he could see the terracotta and salmon pink panels of her skirt, which the shadow made appear black and white. It was his wife. She was leaning on the banisters, listening to something. Gabriel was surprised at her stillness and strained his ear to listen also, but he could hear little save the noise of laughter and dispute on the front steps, a few chords struck on the piano, and a few notes of a man's voice singing. He stood still in the gloom of the hall, trying to catch the air, that the voice was singing and gazing up at his wife. There was grace and mystery in her attitude as if she were a symbol of something. He asked himself, what is a woman standing on the stairs in the shadow listening to distant music a symbol of? If he were a painter, he would paint her in that attitude. Her blue felt hat would show off the bronze of her hair against the darkness and the dark panels of her skirt would show off the light ones. Distant music, he would call the picture if he were a painter. So. There's a, there's a lot going on just in that little passage right there. And I think that it's not necessarily a stretch 
to say that there's a lot that you can take from this as well. It's definitely sort of asking you to interpret it, which is, I think, really fun about literature that does critique symbols, is that it's kind of implied that you're trying to extract some sort of information from this. And so I think that this is a topic I talk about in greater detail in the video that I talk about with Carl Jung. If you guys want to get more into the specifics of the difference between like a text or a thing that you are interpreting and the interpretation of that thing you are interpreting. Um, I hopefully coherently talk about it in that one, but in this one, it definitely seems that um, he's asking you to do that because I think that he even asked the question, that he basically says there was a grace and mystery in her attitude as if she were a symbol of something. So he's literally laying it out there. He asked himself, what is a woman standing on the stairs in the shadow listening to distant music a symbol of? So that's, that's a question. He ends up just, um, it's a period in the way that he writes it in the prose, but he says that he asked himself this. And so I think you as a reader have to say, well, what is a woman standing on the stairs in the shadow listening to distant music a symbol of? Now, since he doesn't make this a declarative statement, you might worry. It's like, are we going to answer this question incorrectly? Are we supposed to, as readers, understand what a woman standing on the stairs in the shadow listening to distant music a symbol of. Is that a symbol of something? Is that necessarily evocative of any one particular thing? Now, it might be worth just for a moment to talk about the difference between signs and symbols for a second because um, there is a little bit of daylight between those things even though they function sort of similarly. So, a sign is something that does not necessarily have an inherent meaning to it, but a symbol is something that does have an inherent meaning to it. So, for example, the octagon of a stop sign, that's just a shape that somebody decided at one point is going to mean stop. So we culturally agree that it means stop, but there's nothing really inherent about an octagon that means stop. Whereas a symbol is something that does have an inherent meaning behind it, such as, um, although, to be fair, I don't think everybody necessarily agrees with this. Um, and I don't mean for the example I'm going to give, but just the idea of something having an inherent meaning. A lot of people think all meaning is something that we just attribute culturally to things, but at least for the purposes of this discussion, I think that there can be a distinction made here. Um, so let me try to think of a good example of it, though. I might be proving my point that there is no inherent meaning to it if I can't think of a example off the top of my head. Um, I think a symbol, you could argue... Um, Oh, like the symbol of a budding flower. I, I feel like it's not a stretch to say that life emerging is a, uh, a, a sort of inherent meaning within that. Now, I don't think that you necessarily have to draw that from a budding flower, but the response that I would give to that is that it's like, yeah, but that's literally what a budding flower is. There's no secondary interpretation that I'm applying to that budding flower that makes it life appearing from nowhere. A budding flower is is life, you know? It, it's, it's basically, we could argue that within that case, life is just a substitute or a synonym for this idea of a budding flower. I don't know how satisfying that is to you. I might have gone on a digression there. But if you can think of any examples of symbols that have an inherent meaning, maybe leave them in the comments. So, to get back to this section in the text here for a moment, he asks himself, what is a woman standing on the stairs in the shadow, listening to distant music, a symbol of. So, I would say my response to that is nothing. There's there's nothing inherent about a woman standing on the top of the stairs listening to distant music, a symbol of. However, the fact that he is trying to extract information from this symbol is what you're supposed to take from this moment. Is that he's sitting there, he's looking at his wife, and he's going, what does this mean? Why? What is What is this, that she's sitting here listening to this distant music and I think he even further supports this idea that he's trying to extract meaning of it by by saying that if he were a painter he would try to capture this attitude this moment that's happening and then name it distant music and so I think you do end up understanding later in the story specifically what she might be thinking about we don't necessarily know because we don't have access to her thoughts at this point in the story, but toward the end, I'll deliver a little bit more information about like why his wife might be sitting there listening to this distant thing 
you know. But at the time, we don't we don't really get that from Gabriel. Gabriel is just this sort of heady guy that is uh, trying to understand what this what this woman. And the reason I say woman is that that's how this paragraph begins. By the way, or the second uh, third sentence in the paragraph, it says a woman was standing near the top of the first flight, in the shadow also. So I think the shadow element of that definitely draws your attention to the fact is that she's a little obscured. Maybe he didn't see her. However, my interpretation of this part of it is that um, this is a woman that, that he is presumably in love with, that he's married to at the very least, and he calls her a woman, that, that she does have this sort of veil over her, that we don't understand exactly what she is at this moment. And so it almost takes him a moment to recognize her. And I think that this is definitely the point of this story in a lot of ways. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating that we're getting this access to Gabriel not completely understanding even who this woman is <laughs> at, the, at the beginning of the story. And to be fair, too, in all of the preceding moments up to this, she does not play a big part in the story. That's a huge key, too. So it's pretty amazing, as you're probably starting to surmise, that the end of the story ends up being very, very focused on his wife, who he's basically been ignoring. Um, instead, it's about his big, important speech. You know, up to this point, at least. So, <clears throat> I think I probably wrung out all of the water I could on that one. At least for this point right now, so I'm going to move on. Oh, and it, man, I'm already taking a lot of time on this. But I told you, this one, this one is a thinker, I think, without a doubt. So, um... Since that moment has happened in the story, he and his wife end up leaving the party and they hop into a carriage, I believe, and this is when he basically starts thinking about his wife a little bit more, being like, oh man, that was such a good party, I got this girl, it was great. Um, and uh, the way that he, that James Joyce is, uh, James Joyce that is, describes this part is, I think a sort of thinly veiled way of saying that he's getting horny. I think that's what's going on here. There's a talk of him asking the carriage driver if the furnace in the carriage is hot. I might be reading into that, but it definitely seems that that's the case. It talks about him wanting to run up behind his wife and say something foolish and affectionate into her ear. And so he's getting a little feisty here. It, it seems that like he thinks he's probably going to go home and get laid, you know? So... There's a good passage here that exemplifies that, that says, A wave of yet more tender joy escaped from his heart and went coursing in warm flood against his arteries. Like the tender fires of stars' moments of their life together that no one knew of or would ever know of broke upon and illuminated, I'm sorry, illumined his memory. I'm going to try this one again. I'm, I'm doing a, kind of uh, a lot of pauses in the reading. Okay. A wave of yet more tender joy escaped from his heart and went coursing in warm flood along his arteries. Like the tender fires of stars, moments of their life together that no one knew of or would ever know of broke upon and illumined his memory. He longed to recall to her those moments, to make her forget the years of their dull existence together and remember only their moments of ecstasy. For the years he felt had not quenched his soul or hers. Their children, his writing, her household cares had not quenched all their soul's tender fire. In one letter that he had written to her, then he had said, Why is it that words like these seem to me so dull and cold? Is it because there is no word tender enough to be your name? Like distant music, these words that he had written years before were born to get, uh, towards him from the past. He longed to be alone with her. When the others had gone away, when he and she were in the room in the hotel, then they would be alone together. He would call to her softly, Greta! Okay, so I'm not just trying to be foolish and saying Greta that way, but I think that that is a, uh, a basically significant punctuation at this point because James Joyce specifically writes, he would call to her softly after giving you this very sappy description of all these moments from their past coming together. Greta! And there's a big exclamation point there. So I don't think that that's an accident. James Joyce is a pretty specific, meticulous writer, and so I think that this contrast between calling to her softly and then giving you this explanation after him calling out to his wife is a specific reference and delivery on the promise made in what he had written in this line in the paragraph just above, which is, 
Why is it that words like these seem to me so dull and cold? Is it because there is no word tender enough to be your name? Now that's a pretty sweet thing to say. I think maybe a little sentimental, but this is him sort of further grasping with this idea of kind of trying to extract meaning, is that he's a writer, after all, and he is trying to basically express something to her in this moment, but all of the words are just not adding up. That um, it's, it's just sort of an empty sign, I guess in this case, that uh, doesn't really encapsulate everything. And he basically says that explicitly. Is it because there's no word tender enough to be your name? So that's, that's a very sweet thing to say. And then that, that uh, part of the passage ends with him basically saying, Greta! I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm reading into that too much, but I thought that that was definitely an interesting part that um, basically takes all of that information about the distant music. They even say, like distant music, these words he had written in the past before were born towards him from the past. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's taking that aspect of him trying to extract meaning from the staircase scene in the passage that I just read a step further. He's basically wrestling with what sort of meaning is he trying to extract from his wife? And is that even a good thing to do? I don't think he's quite there yet asking that question, is that even a good thing to do? But I think that that's what the entire story asks. And I would say that that, that is almost a, a feminist idea of him looking at his wife as a symbol, as a sign of something that he should be trying to extract meaning from. Like, what does a, what does a, a woman mean? You know, it's like, that's not... I don't even know that's a good question. You know, I think that's definitely something people wrestle with. It's not something to look down on, necessarily. But I think that thinking of other people in your life, especially your romantic partner, as a symbol of something is what Gabriel is dealing with in this story, is that he just looks at her as this thing that he's supposed to be getting things from. <laughs> so uh, I think when you say it that way, it becomes a little bit more clear that this is this is an issue. This is this problem that he's dealing with as a character. So the idea of problems that characters have is something I deal with in greater detail in the video called Writing Interesting Characters, I believe. So if you want to talk more about that, go watch that video. So now we're going to get to the actual end, and I'm running over time on this video anyway, so it is about damn time. This is the very end of the story. So just a little bit of lead up. They finally get to the hotel room. Gabriel, horny as ever. Basically, um, his pants are tenting up at this point. He is really ready to have some sex with his wife. But his wife does isn't really in the mood. And the, the way that that comes out is a very powerful moment in the story too. And I think it's, it, it might even play for humor a little bit because they're there and he's, he's like ready to... Uh, get things going, and he basically, I forget what he does specifically, he, he sort of makes a move, and she starts crying, and she basically tells him that there was this guy that she used to date, who she is pretty sure died for her, and the facial expression that I imagine happened on Gabriel Conroy's face is like, this is not what I thought was going to happen when we got back to the hotel. I thought that we were going to have sex, or at least have a good, intimate moment. Um, so, to have his wife start talking about this other guy that she used to date is a, um, yeah, a bit of a bummer. So, I think that is definitely funny to me, but this is when Gabriel's revelation begins to happen, and we get to see that character change, which happens very powerfully, because... Um, without reading through the whole scene and the whole dialogue where the information is laid out, his wife tells him that she was dating this guy named Michael Fury, I think I'm uh, pronouncing his last name right, who was a very delicate, sweet boy, and um, he, he got very sick because, oh God, I forget the exact detail, but he was like standing by her window on a kind of say anything moment and braved the cold to tell her he loved her. Oh man, I'm really butchering the most important part of this great story. But it was something to that effect. She basically, the, the long and short of that section is that Michael Fury ended up standing in the rain to shout up at her window and he gets sick and dies. And so she is dealing with this, thinking about this years later after she's been married, after she's had kids. And she's thinking about this at the moment that Gabriel is 
convinced that this is one of the most intimate moments that they've ever had together, that all of these sort of dull moments from their past have been washed away, and this ecstasy has finally returned. And so they're, they're on completely different pages here. So um, she ends up falling asleep, and he's uh, kind of like, okay, I guess we will not be having sex. But he does have a revelation in this moment, is that his wife is a person. That is the big revelation at the end. And so maybe that might not seem satisfying because no duh. Of course his wife is a person. But he was basically treating her, like I said, as the symbol, something that he's supposed to be extracting meaning from. And so he learns in this moment that his wife has a past. His wife's life does not revolve around him. She was in love with somebody else. And somebody who appears to be probably more... Uh, a better lover than Gabriel was. He, he's out there in, in the rain, screaming up at her window. Um, and everyone wants that. So this is basically the end of the story now, and it, it gives me chills when I read it, so I'm very excited to read it again, uh, just to tap back into that. But we, uh, yeah, we, we get Gabriel's character change here. So he says, Generous tears filled Gabriel's eyes. He had never felt like that himself toward any woman, but he knew that such a feeling must be love. The tears gathered more thickly in his eyes. In the partial darkness, he imagined he saw the form of a young man standing under a dripping tree. Other forms were near. His soul had approached the region where dwell the vast hosts of the dead. He was conscious of, but could not apprehend their wayward and flickering existence. His own identity was fading out into a gray, palpable world. The solid world itself, which these dead had one time reared and lived in was dissolving and dwindling. So I think just a, a quick pause at this point in the story. All of Dubliners is usually trotted out as an example of something that is strict realism. And so in the last two paragraphs of the entire collection, we get, and I don't think he's talking about in a metaphorical way, this is like an experience that this character is happening that his own identity is fading away into a gray, impalpable world, the solid world itself, which these dead had one time reared and lived in, was dissolving and dwindling. So, if, if we are to take that at its word, he's almost having this psychedelic moment where all everything that he thought were these stable borders are completely dissolving around him and breaking down, and he's having experiences with the dead. So, also it's called the dead, so I don't think it's too far of a stretch to read into it in that part, but um, it's it's a pretty powerful moment. I also forgot to mention this earlier, but one reading of Dubliners as a whole text is one life set through different characters, because the characters do get progressively older as they go, and they deal with different problems that are particular to that sort of age and period of life. And also, the very first story in this collection is about a denial of death, about a young boy who was friends with a priest, and the priest dies, and the, the young boy doesn't really know how to respond to it. So, now here at the very end of the collection, we get Gabriel with dead bodies swirling around him. So, that's a hell of a character change if you ask me, even though it's spread across several different characters and several different stories. But I digress. The very last paragraph. A few light taps upon the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to set out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. Remember, he was wiping it off of his shoes at the beginning of the story, and now it's general all over Ireland. Ireland. Although, to be fair, I think they mentioned that a little bit earlier than this moment in the story. But Snow, that is, it was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Allen and farther westward, softly falling into the dark mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling, too, upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury was buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. That's about as good as it gets, folks. Um, holy shit. So, again, I don't know if you can necessarily feel the weight of it after just having me tell it to you out of context. Reading it is obviously, you get the weight of, of the story a lot more. But let's focus in on just those last couple sentences here for a moment. So, like I said, 
the snow is falling all over Ireland, which I think you can interpret as, as death. This thing that has been rejected so earlier in the collection and now it's falling everywhere is that the dead are all around us. The, the, our ancestors and even your wife's ex-boyfriend. Um, it was falling too upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all of the living and the dead. <laughs> oh man, it's like, oh, it, that's just about, um, oh my lord. So, <laughs> I think that in this moment that this is Gabriel realizing that not just that his wife is also a person, but that he is a part of this big human experience that is so much bigger and more powerful and more cosmic than his dumb little life where he's a writer. That um, He's a big part of this entire mysterious universe that does not completely make sense to him and it does have all of these undisclosed rules that the dead are still among us, that there is this cosmic mystery to everything that can make it so that this dead guy is coming back at the end. And I think that that, what I just said, the dead guy coming back, it could be supported even a little bit more further by a few light taps on the pane made him turn to the window. I might be stretching this a little bit and talking that I think you can look at this as maybe Michael Fury tapping on the window. I don't know. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but um, I think that another moment here at the end when it says his soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling. I think that you could argue that when he says it's his soul, that they're talking about Michael Fury. I don't know if we necessarily can say 100% that they're talking about Gabriel here. Now, if it is Gabriel, that's still cool, but under my interpretation that this is Michael Fury who is swooning, we can look at this is that at the very last second in this collection and at the very last second in the story after giving you this protagonist Gabriel kind of steps out of the way he's like I am not the protagonist anymore I thought that I was but it turns out Michael Fury the guy that we don't even know anything about the guy that used to date his wife that's the protagonist at this last moment that's this last shot that we get this this human that's dead that we don't really know very much about so it it's it's a hell of a move that's, that's like, I think it is a lot more formally interesting than it might first appear because he's not writing and then Gabriel, the protagonist, was no longer the protagonist and somebody else was. But I think that you can interpret that from this section here that um, especially in light of what Gabriel is learning here is that he is part of this broader human experience and that people are more complex and interesting than just his, you know, the ideas swirling around in his head. Um, I, I could go on forever with this one. There's, there's a billion little thematic details about snow and about other dead people in the story. Um, I'm almost tempted to say now, it's like, what if they were all dead the whole time? I don't know if that's necessarily true, but who knows? Um, yeah, this is, uh, already getting pretty long for this video, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there. I could do probably a whole channel just about this story. Um, I have been considering giving Ulysses a try again because